Hello guys, welcome, or if this is you've been here before to this channel, welcome back guys, I'm the Philadelphia Hoovian, and for this video, this is going to be a video about my countdown, or like, you know, my listing of episodes from my least favorite to my favorite of that beautiful season from the fourth Doctor era, The Keys to Time. The Keys to Time. Yeah, am I right? Am I right? This is an awesome, awesome season. All right, the keys of time, while it was an awesome season, here's the thing why I feel like it has a special place in my heart. The keys to time, y you have to understand, this is the first time, like literally guys, this was the first time ever I ha owned a complete season of a classic Who season. From classic Doctor Who, this was the very first time I bought a full season, and it's the only time, I think, I'll, let's put a pin in that, the only time I, I think, put a pin in that, that I ever saw a season on all the episodes in chronological order. Because there are a couple more seasons which I do have all the episodes to that one, one season from Classic Who. But, I don't think I ever saw them in order. Like that, or This is the only time where I saw from the very first episode to the last episode a season entire in pure sequential order. Actual and completely in order. So this is a special season for me because my first ever full Classic Who season, as well as the first and only time I might have seen a season in chronological sequence. Thus making it completely awesome and will always have a special place in my heart if it already didn't because of just how darn good this season is. Oh my god. Okay, this season came under the production of, Barry, um, I think, of Grand Williams. Let me check about that. I could be wrong. Yeah! Graham Williams, you gorgeous creature. This is around a time that Doctor Who began to take on fantastical elements. Like, almost had a fantasy way about it. And, um, just gave you some more, like, you know, epic feels to it. This is when, like, the show is like, let's get, change our, t our direction in some, some ways and get really ambitious. And this was got pretty ambitious before, but this is what made this season great is it shows what Doctor Who is all about. Reinventing itself. Doing different things. Exploring new territories. We Whovians, um, as long as you stay true to the essence of the characters and the companions and what their roles are, you can do different things with Doctor Who and explore different territories as long as you're just keeping in the style of what Doctor Who kind of is. But you can go in different directions. And that's like, you know, the problem I think sometimes I have with, you know, Whovians. You know, they're quick to say, oh, you know, this was not right or this was not right um, because it's not in essence with like kind of the doctor's, you know, you know, the way Doctor Who has always been. But I understand sometimes when people have that excuse. I make that excuse myself. But there are other times where I'm like, that is a dumb thing to say. Because Doctor Who has had plenty of times where it did different things and reinvented itself. And when I'm showing you the cattiness of some people where they say, oh yeah, this was a terrible, this is where Doctor Who really was going down the drain. And that episode was um, in deep breath. When Matt Smith made a phone call to Clara about how she needs to embrace this next Doctor and he needs her help. I literally went tit for tat an argument with a, you know... <laughs> With a person on YouTube once where he's like, this shows how terrible, how terrible, you know, the show has become. I said, why? He said, because the simple fact that, God, you know, the 11th Doctor made an appearance in the 12th Doctor's, you know, season. That is so terrible. That never happens. That is so ridiculous. I'm like, that did happen. The Sixth Doctor era, Patrick Troughton made an appearance in the his uh, first, uh, the Sixth Doctor's first official season. What are you talking about? It happened. I'm like, well, he's like, what I meant was, like, you know, in the first story of a new Doctor, the other, the previous Doctor should not make an appearance. It's it's terrible because it's never been done before. This is Doctor Who, a show that is full of first times for everything. You know, it's like, and I'm like, okay, let me get this straight. You've seen the doctor fall in love with a teenage girl at this point. You've seen the doctor, you know, have make a human version of himself when his, um, 
companion touched his hand, his, you know, severed hand. You've seen that. You've seen the TARDIS fly through a highway. You've seen the TARDIS be late in, in the most incredible ways before. You know, you've seen many first times for everything at this point. Why are you acting like this is the first time something new has happened now? So, that's what I like about this season. It gave you um, different elements. It gave you new ideas. And it showed how you can take the same thing or take the same style of something but give new, take it in different directions. That's what I mean by a different direction. I don't mean like rapidly changing the character of the Doctor, changing his relationship with the companion. That's a pretty constant idea that should, you know, it's nice when it stays constant. I'm trying to go changing certain elements of the show to give you a different feel to things. And the keys of time does feel a little different. It really does. Okay, so now comes my episode ranking from my least favorite to my favorite of the Keys to Time. This glorious, glorious season. Sorry. I know, I've said it before, but this one, glorious season. So, here comes my least favorite. Um, I don't know if this is a controversial last entry amongst the whole Whovian universe, because when I go on, like, you know... I see reviews of it, people purchased it, they put this story relatively high, mine's is low. This in fact is the only see episode, the only story from this season that I just don't like. And it's unfortunate because it's the very last episode of the season, and it is the Armageddon Factor. Whew, yeah, oh dear god, I'm sure it's a controversial concept, isn't that? Um, I want to say it's written by Bob Baker and Dave Martin. I think it was. Mm -hmm. But this, uh, it just, first of all, it just, it's like, a, I think it's the only six-parter in this one, in this season. I think the rest of them are four-parters. This is a six-parter, and this really would have profited from being a four-parter. There wasn't enough material in it to make it six parts. I'm okay with long stories, epic stories of Doctor Who, but you have to have enough elements in action and, you know, details to make it worth being a six-parter or an eight-parter or a ten-parter. There has to be enough to keep that, that, you know, that length going. There wasn't. With the Armageddon factor, there just wasn't enough story in there. And the, the, the plot, you know, the premise is not bad. It's the idea of, you know, the Doctor arriving for the last, you know, segment to the Keys of Time. And then he goes on this planet where, you know, there are two, you know, sister planets who are at war with each other. But it turns out the other planet isn't, there's no one even on that planet. So who are they really fighting? And that turns out the last segment is a person. Oh, sorry, hiccups. Hiccups. Must cure that. Sorry. Sorry, hiccups are coming. Must fight them. Mm -hmm. And then the keys of time turns out to be in the princess. And so, but they were like, oh, we can't kill a princess. We can't do that. What are you talking about? In terms of the white guardian, right now he's really the black guardian. It just... It's so sad that it's not that good to me because it's the last entry where everything is culminating. And it shows how sometimes when you're doing a season that's, you know, gearing up to one thing and it's gearing up to that one element, sometimes it's the last story that can really make everything fall, fall flat. Everything that that one season was angling up to, it just sometimes everything just falls apart when that last story, because the last story just can't hold up under the weight of all that it had been building up to it. And that's why I think sometimes finales fall flat. This is a prime example of, like, you know, you're leading up to a finale, and you had all this good stuff up leading up to it, but sometimes... Sometimes that ending's just gonna fall flat because you just can't hold up under the weight of all that you were building up to. That, that, that's just a theory. I have no argument. I have no real... It's Again, that's subjective theory. There's no objectivity to it. No objectivity. And could be a wrong theory. Mm -hmm. So, my number four slot. God, this is, this was a hard list to make, because honestly, guys, I mean, I really like all the other entries. I really do. I am really do. And this next entry is going to be very controversial for putting it under the number five slot, because... It's usually held as the number number one. Guys, I'm going to say it right now. I know all five of these remaining stories are equally awesome. At this point, I am a very subjective person. This is just, it's my list. I can't change the fact that, 
At number five, again, it's a great story. I understand why it's hailed as perfect. I great story. It is the androids of Terra. Please don't kill me. I'm sorry. Guys, I love the story, but I just like all of them equally. I really do. I love all the stories at this point equally. Now it's just something's got to go at the bottom besides the Armageddon Factor, which definitely deserves to be at the bottom. It deserves it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. The Androids of Terra is a very good idea. Um, and this is one where actually Romana goes off on her own and she gets the, I believe she gets the key relatively quickly but she gets embroiled quickly in a problem and then turns out she looks like the princess and there are androids involved a lot of you know and there's a lot of you know back and forth trying to get the androids working because there's a whole big ruthless ruthless guy and this who will kill anybody in any second and it's a very very good story it's really well paced it's well done it is very perfect and it has that fantasy element to it that's very good fantasy element to it that I've been loving so much but it just hit the number five please don't kill me guys don't kill me why would you do that why would you don't please don't shall we okay now at the number four slot um i don't think this is really terrible putting this at number four um it's a great story i got to this point there i love all the these five stories so it's not evil, but come number four, the pirate planet. Oh, yes, you've got a planet in this one that consumes other planets into itself. Oh, my God, think of all the lives that were lost. And when that happens, all these jewels just show up everywhere. And, you know, um, the you know the doctor and Romana show up to get the key there. And they get, you know, wrapped up in this pirate planet concept. And it turns out that the real culprit behind it all was an old woman who put her body into a young woman who was controlling everyone around her, including the captain, who you thought was the real bad guy. And there's not enough spoken about that, that actress. The actress who played that character, um, who was the, the real villain, you know, the older woman in the young woman's body, she was fantastic. Go back and watch her acting. I mean, the acting in this is fantastic. The acting is very good overall. But she was just, she was Shakespearean. The, she played literally a Shakespearean actress, like, you know, she probably was a Shakespearean stage, stage actress, and she played that performance up to the nines. She was very good. It was, this was a very well, also very well directed film. A very well directed film. Uh, the, sorry, not film, story. Very well directed story. Um, so I really much like it, the pirates, you know, the pirate planet. I have no problem, you know, at all with it. Again, no problem with these five entries. They're all perfect, but the list now is just a very subjective list, and I go off of what I watch the most. Which episode do I always watch from this one the most? That's what I'm ranking them as. Okay, now. So, for number three, I don't think that this is, um, too controversial. The Rabbis Operation. The Ribus Operation, now, this story, is okay, this one is the very first part in the time we got introduced to the White Guardian, and he puts them onto the mission, puts the Doctor on a mission to get the keys to time, and assigns him to a companion, and we first meet Romana, Verona London, sorry, it's a hard name to say, and she says, you can call me Fred, and he says, okay, come on, Romana. Yeah, yes, I love that. And the bickering between these two, I love it from the very get-go. Some people do not like the first Romana. I like the first Romana. I mean, I love the second Romana, too, but I like the first Romana. And if people who criticize this Romana, their criticism to that her is that um, she's kind of bossy, or she thinks she knows more than the doctor, um, or she thinks this is equal. Here's the thing you got to remember. Romana was a time lady. Or time lord, whatever you want to call her. Who, when they did, you know, went to the same academy he went to, did really well in her classes. She is his own species. She's not going to be that amazed by him over and over again when she first meets him. That's not the way their their relationship is going to work or should work, from a realistic standpoint. And also, it made her different than previous, you know, entries into the companion, you know, the companion station. So it's it was very different. A nice fresh take on what a companion was. So I liked it from the very beginning. And they arrive on the, you know, they arrive on a ribos and they immediately get, you know, into this con man scheme by accident, just trying to get this segment of the keys to time and, 
you got that crazy warlord oh god he was so evil and the doctor just like not being afraid to put that switch like using laser man and switching the bombs and blowing him up he had every reason and justification for it and this um, story gets some criticism for being wor being boring because it's wordy but you know what? I gotta give Robert Holmes some good credit for this because I'm not bored watching it. I'm really interested in the story. I'm interested in how it unfolds. And then as it progresses, when you have the one con man who's sitting and talking with the um the astrologist or, or astronomist, and they're just having a conversation. I think it was Ben Rowe and the older guy, and it's a simple conversation just talking about the stars and all that, and it was beautiful. And I'm okay with stuff like that. I'm okay with you sometimes taking time away from the story to have a really cool moment, as long as the moment is cool. As long as it's a good, cool moment. I'm okay with that. A nice moment of mirror conversation where you're sitting down talking. I am perfectly okay with that. Very much so. Um, so yeah, I actually like the ribus operation. Ironically, though, ooh... Dear God, here comes the controversial one because my number two slot is often hailed not only as the worst story in this, um, se you know, this season, but often those who do like the Ribus Operation think it's way better than my number two entry. But I, I can only be who I am, guys. I can only be who I am. And the fact is, my number two slot for the Keys of Time ranking of episodes is The Power of Kroll. I know. I'm weird. What do you want from me? I never get bored watching The Power of Kroll. I never get bored watching it. I just really don't. It's, it just feels action-packed. They use their environment really well. And that's what I like when they use their environments really well. It's the reason I like this entire experiment. I like when the, in the case of Androzani, the good use of environment. Use your environment. Also, I like the planet of fire. I like when environment is used to the maximum. I love when that stuff happens. And that happens really well for me in, you know, the power of Kroll. And people criticize Kroll for being bad special effects with the um the drives with Kroll with the squid like object you know rising out I think for that time period he was very very good special effects actually I think he was a wonderful special effect mm -hmm. and for Kroll to turn out that he was the segment another segment to the keys the entire time I like stuff like that I totally enjoy it I totally dig it I'm sorry I do um I really, and also there were some very good lines. I mean, the Doctor and Ramana have some very good lines and very good interactions all throughout the season. Oh my god, so many good interactions. But something about a couple of the interactions or lines that the Doctor and Ramana had in this one, I like a lot too. I really do. And same with the Pirate Planet. When Ramana was arrested and she says, she hands the object to them and says, okay. And she gets right into the car, the people were arresting her, and she said, I suppose that you all know, know the way. She just got in the car, the police car, and then she's being driven off into, the, like, you know, into the air, and she's about talking about how they can increase the speed of the vehicle. I mean, Ravana is just wonderful. She has the same, like, fourth doctor, like, I could be, you know, headed towards my doom. <laughs> headed towards my doom, and I'll still joke every now and again while it's all happening. I gotta give, I, I like that dynamic. So for my number one slot, I don't think anyone almost ever puts this in their number one slot, but it is mine, and oh my god, I, it's because it, number one, it's just good, it's well done to me, but number two, whew, I just never get bored watching it. Again, I loved, it's about rewatchability for me. I, me, it's all about rewatchability, and I love watching The Stones of Blood. I think it's like the middle episode. Let me see. You can check that. Yeah, one, two, three. Yeah, it's right there in the middle. The Stones of Blood. I want to say it's written by David Fisher, but I could be completely wrong about that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, The Stones of Blood. I absolutely love this story. It's a very good Earth-based story. And again, using your environment really well. The Stones of Blood is a very good use of the environment. The idea of, you know, you know that type of mythology of sacrifices, of, you know... Sorry. I want to say, they're not mages, are they? It could be, sorry. That type of, that type of mythos and all that. Is really cool, but I think what also adds to it 
is the old woman. Oh my god. Like the old professor who she's she just starts talking immediately. I just love it. Here she is, this old woman. I mean, this woman could probably be knocked down by like a heavy wind, but she is tough as nails at the same time. Like when you got the huge stones that go off to kill people, she literally whips out something and says to the doctor, and then something like in the name of science or for the for the sake of science, we should capture that object, doctor. This is an old woman. This woman, that stone was going to kill her. It's killed people before, but her instinct is, we need to capture it for the sake of science. Oh my god, I just love that badass older person in, in like, you know, the Doctor Who worlds. Especially those badass older women, the baddie old women who cannot harm anything, but they're still tough as nails. They're probably going to die on the mission that they would go on, but they'll do it anyway. I'm sorry, I totally dig stuff like that. So the professor, she is such a great character, and she's very good for the Doctor and Romana to work off of. And for her friend to have been the culprit the entire time, oh! And then she turns out to be silver, she's completely silver, and then the story changes to being a trial after we figure out, like, you know, the stones of blood, you know, what the stones are, and like, you know, how they are sent out to kill people if it is her who's sending them off. And then there's this parallel world, or this different universe connected there, and then a doctor happens to open a door, and he opens the door to these invisible, you know, attorneys, and a trial happens. And I think that that's where people get turned off the idea of the story switching in that way um, from being just this story, the earth-based story where you try to look for the stones and then it turns out that, you know, there's this mythological thing going on, um, sacrifices are happening to a trial on a spaceship. I love that. I'm sorry, I actually like it so much because it makes me, it shows me how Doctor Who can go in any direction it wants to if the story permits it. I'm okay with stories going in these different directions. I'm fine with it because it shows me the writers are being very creative and the production team is letting them be creative and we're letting them be creative along with us as the audience watching them. I am fine with that. I'm fine with you being uber creative. This is Doctor Who. This is where you should do things like that. So I'm all for stuff like that. And then the stone, I believe, ends up being the necklace or something that she was wearing. Oh, yes. In the end, it was like, the professor, after the TARDIS disappears, and like, you know, she still, I still have my professional reputation to consider, which is why she can't tell anyone about this, because they'll call her crazy. Oh, God, I love that professor character so very much. I think it's just so cool. So, yeah, I love that story very much, and... It's just something about it I just never get tired of. I never, ever do. So, yes, that is my ranking. Just to give you a recap, it went the Armageddon Factor, which will, God knows, always be on the bottom of my list. Then came the Androids of Terra. I know a controversial fifth choice, but what can you do? I, what can you do? Uh-huh. And then you had the Pirate Planet. Then you had the Ribus Operation. Then you had um, the Power of Kroll. And the number one slot, you had the Stones of Blood. That is my episode ranking of the very first full season of Classic Who that I bought in the perhaps only season, put a pen in that, um, season that I saw all the episodes in chronological sequence. So thank you guys so very much for watching. Hope you enjoyed my video. Thank you guys again. You were awesome. So what is your episode ranking of The Keys to Time? What are your favorite stories from that season? Do you even like that season? It's a damn good season. You know it is, right? You know it is. So guys, thanks again for watching. Hope you enjoyed yourselves. Make it a peaceful one.